turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 8, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11, Deuteronomy 8, 11. Uh, if you're not real familiar with your Bible, but you've got one, it's the fifth book in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's one right in front of you. It's black. It's in the rack in the pew in front of you. You can find it on page 153, 153 in the pew Bible, Deuteronomy 8, 11. I'll read on through the end of that chapter. Uh, I want to remind you that we will have a presentation from the elders, long range planning and the finance committee in a few minutes. As soon as I'm done preaching and we finish this service, we'll go to the fellowship hall and uh, we'll hear that presentation. Uh, so, I encourage you to be a part of that. It's not a members only kind of thing. If you're attending here, uh, you very well could have vested interest in that plan, and we want you to hear it and be a part of it. So, uh, that'll be 9.45 or as near 9.45 as we can pull off uh, in the fellowship hall. So, we'll need to, uh, we'll need to skedaddle uh, pretty quickly uh, after this service is over. I also want to just echo what Brent said about um, uh, your participation Friday night. Appreciate so many of you coming and being involved with that. Great opportunity for us to serve our community, and you really showed up. I didn't get to be in on it. I had a rehearsal, wedding rehearsal and, and dinner. Got to be involved in a little bit of the setup, but I know you guys showed up and served so well, and I'm just grateful for you, and I know uh, the, the staff and the students at at Rich Pond Elementary felt loved and supported, encouraged as they begin the school year. So thanks for being part of that, just loving our community well, part of the reason why God has put us right here. Now, if you've been kind of with me a good bit of the summer, most of you have taken vacation, so you've missed a Sunday or two, but we've been talking about faith and work all summer long and the way uh, our discipleship uh, relates to what we do Monday through Friday, m many of us, uh, that that's not segmented off and that's not a spiritual pursuit, but Jesus says mine over the entirety of our lives. And so he certainly would say mine over our work life. If, if you've been following that, paying attention to that, if the Lord has brought some conviction there and you are, uh, your blood's up to do better in the workplace and you've start embracing biblical principles in the way that you follow Jesus in the workplace, which would be you work hard and you work with excellence and you work to improve your skill so that you can do all of that well. You, you work out a love for neighbor, those who receive the benefit of your labor, uh, those who perhaps you labor with, uh, you love, you express love for your employer and ultimately you see your work as working for Christ. Because Paul says in Colossians 3, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. If, if you do that and you, you, you follow the Lord faithfully, not perfectly, but you see your work as part of your discipleship, and if you do that and you avoid the pitfalls of despising your work and falling idle in it or idolizing your work and worshiping it, if you avoid those errors, and, and then if you just steward faithfully what the Lord brings to you. You live within your means, you give, and you save. Uh, good things normally happen. Now, I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher, so I'm not saying do A, B, C, D, E, and God will bless you, and you will be wealthy and healthy and wise. That is not what I'm saying. Sometimes you can do all of those things well, and life still goes really hard. We follow Jesus. He did it all perfectly, but life went hard and he died a cruel death. We follow in his steps. So not always, but often when you live this way, you're living according to the grain of the universe and blessing tends to come with that. But with the blessings that come also come temptation. The blessings are dangerous. They are fraught with temptation and difficulty. And uh, you need to be aware of it. And in this text, although the context is very different, Moses is warning the people of Israel about uh, the dangers that come with the blessings that come from faithfulness. So uh, that's what we're looking at today. Um, 
There was an old Puritan preacher uh, in the early part of this country. His name was Cotton Mather. He would have been kind of second generation of those who first uh, came from Europe to settle in America. And he said something like this, religion uh, brought forth prosperity and the daughter destroyed the mother. Religion brought forth prosperity and the daughter destroyed the mother. Uh, he's describing exactly the realities that Moses describes here in Deuteronomy 8 and we're going to deal with today. So we'll, before we leave faith and work, this one and next week will be the last sermons on it. We need to hear these warnings. So this is the word of the Lord. Let's honor it by standing together. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments and His rules and His statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the power to get wealth, that He may confirm His covenant that He swore to your fathers as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. Let's pray. Open our eyes, Lord, that we may behold wonderful things out of your law. This we pray for Jesus' sake and in Jesus' name, amen. You can take your seat. It is true, not always the case, but often, most often, when you live well with respect to your work, blessings tend to come. You work hard, you work excellently. Those who hired you notice these things. They tend to strengthen your position over time, and you tend to make more money if you steward that well. You live within your means, you give, you save, then your capacity and your production of wealth tends to increase over time. That's just the way the Lord has structured His universe. Again, we're not prosperity gospel people, so we, we're not saying this always happens. Some of you have done everything really, really well and excellently, and things still went hard. You still lost the job, the company downsized, whatever. Those things happen in a broken world, but most often good things come to those who whose discipleship impacts the workplace. And with that comes a level of wealth, and with that comes danger. And so we want to begin today just considering the warning that Moses gives. Now, we ought to set context a little bit. Moses is an old man. He's 120 years old. And he's at the very end of his life. The Lord has told him, you're not going to cross this Jordan and go in with him to take possession of the land. So he climbed the mountain, he looked over Jordan, he saw the land flowing with milk and honey, but he wasn't going to get to go. But these are really, the book of Deuteronomy, it's Moses' last words. He loves these people, he's, he's been with them and born with them through these 40 years in the wilderness, and now his time is up, he's handing it off to Joshua. But he wants to warn them, you're going to go in the land, you're going to serve the Lord. It's a good land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And when you do that, good things are going to happen, blessings are going to come, but there's going to be a danger with the blessing. 
that you get so fixated on the wealth that's produced that you forget the God who gave them. And you absolutely must not forget him. If you forget him, really bad things are going to happen. It's destructive of your soul and your life. And it's just unjust, isn't it? Because the strength, the wisdom, the knowledge, uh, the, in, the heart inclination to work hard and well, you didn't produce that on your own. You received that as a gift from the Lord. And things falling into place for you, and even the gift of a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, we, we can't equate uh, ancient Israel and their covenant relationship with God with modern America and our relationship to God. That's, that, that's misusing Scripture, so we're not doing that. But there is enough overlap. Would you say that we live in a land flowing with milk and honey? Would you say that out of these valleys and hills flow springs of water and rivers and lots of good things? And it's a land that can produce lots of good food for us. So it's not so different in many ways. There may be parts of the world where you could work hard and well, and it would be rather fruitless as far as your production of wealth. But if you do it here in this land flowing with milk and honey, many of the same things that Moses is describing here are likely, not certainly, this is not promises, are likely to come your way. But with them, there will be a seductive temptation to get so fixated on the wealth, on the stuff, on the blessing, that you get this horrible amnesia about the blesser, the one who provided it all. And you forget gratitude, who gave it, and all of those things. And this will be destructive of your soul. And corporately together, if we fall into that pattern as a church, just loving and enjoying our prosperity and the pleasures that come from that, and forgetting about the brokenness in the world and the need, and that all of those image bearers in this world don't enjoy the same kinds of blessings. It'll be destructive of our life together as well, and our faithfulness to the Lord. We simply must not forget. And yet, uh, strewn throughout this book of Deuteronomy are similar kinds of warnings to this, Moses knowing that there would be great temptation under the blessing of God for them to forget him. We must not do that. And we wouldn't, it wouldn't be right for us to end a series on faith and work without hearing the warning of Scripture about this. That's the first front we want to look at today. The, the second one the second one is the fruit of forgetfulness, the fruit of forgetfulness. Or we might add an adjective, the bitter fruit of forgetfulness. So let's look at some of these. Look at verse 14. When these things happen, all this multiplication that he's describing there, and the good houses that are full of good things, and you've eaten and are full, and silver and gold multiplied, all of that. Verse 14, then your heart be lifted up your heart be lifted up. So one of the fruit of forgetfulness is it's, it's this condition of an exalted heart. Now, if you spend a little time in late James, the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4, James spends some time talking about exalted hearts. He uses different language, selfish ambition and bitter envy. But then he says, where you, but really that's the condition of an exalted heart. And then he says, where you find those things, you find every disorder and every vile practice. Exalted hearts destroy. You may remember that silly king, Nebuchadnezzar, up on the roof of his palace recorded in the book of Daniel. Sometimes bad things happen when kings walk along the roof tops, you know, and he's walking along there and he, he uh, looks across Babylon and he says, is this not great Babylon that I have built for the majesty of my glory and by the power of my 
hand. Not a perfect quote, but that's the gist of what happens there. What's going on there? His heart is exalted in his forgetfulness about who gave him the strength, who gave him the opportunity, who gave him the city. Uh, it's not like he did all the hammering out there in Babylon. He was the king. He had a lot of slave labor, I expect, that did much of that. But all that's forgotten. This is me and mine, and I did it. It's almost godlike language, isn't it? There is none beside me. Uh, some of you may remember the, move, the Jimmy Stewart movie, Shenandoah. There's this... Uh, there's this scene there where he's gathered with his family around the table, and he's going to say grace, and he says something like this, Lord, uh, we took this land, we cleared it, we plowed it, we planted the fields, we tended them, watered them, we harvested them, we prepared this food. It wouldn't be here if we hadn't done it all ourselves. And then he said, thank you. It seemed a little hollow, <laughs> really because he didn't leave room for the Lord's activity in it at all. We, 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 I, 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 I. If you forget the Lord and your prosperity, you'll have an exalted heart. And that exalted heart can be the destruction of you and the destruction of yours. So hear the warning, it's bitter fruit. And then a second bitter fruit is distorted perception. Distorted per perception. Verse 17, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. He's, he's thinking, I did it. Lord didn't do it. My heart exalts, and then in my exalted heart, I start imagining things. And the, and, and the imagination distorts reality. I didn't do it. These are gifts received, not wages earned. How is it that so often a people that are so, so zealous for pure grace in the way we think about the gospel so quickly can drift into a works-based mentality about other things in our lives? I did this. I worked hard. I earned the degree. I did all of this, and then I made the money, and I built the house, and I created the wealth, and I guarded it. I built the house. I watched over the city. I, 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 I. It's distorted perception. It's not seeing anything clearly. It's very similar to the problem in Romans 1, isn't it? Though they knew God, they neither glorified him as God or gave thanks to him. And their foolish hearts were darkened. It's like Paul Tripp uses this analogy. When we get far from God, when we forget for him, forget him. It's like we're in the carnival and we go in that little spot where they have carnival mirrors. And the tiny little things of life get huge, like our own capacity and ability and what we've done. And the huge things in life get really tiny, like God and what he's done. Everything gets distorted when we forget him. And the simplicity of the life that we're supposed to have and the simplicity of the hearts that we're supposed to experience all that begins to go out the window because we've forgotten our God. Everything gets distorted, and it is bitter fruit. And it'll be bitter not only for you individually. It will be bitter for your family. It will be bitter for us corporately. So exalted hearts, distorted perceptions. And then a third thing is just idolatry. Idolatry. Verse 19. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Idolatry. It, it, it just happens. Nature hates a vacuum. And spiritual realities hate vacuums too. Whether you know it or not, you were designed by God to be a worshiper. And you will worship. You could have just wandered in here this morning and the reality of your heart and your belief system is, you're an agnostic, or maybe you're even an atheist. You're not even sure God exists. But whether you are an atheist or not, I promise you, you are a worshiper. Your heart is being given to something because that's the way God designed you. And if you forget him, then you will be giving your worship somewhere else or to something else. And any idol 
any worship rooted anywhere else but this one true, glorious, triune God at the root of that idolatry, you're going to find yourself there. These puny little idols, we think we can manipulate them and can control them, and really, ultimately, uh, we're the ones thinking we're in charge. And idolatrous worship ultimately runs to self-worship. It was the original temptation, wasn't it? For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And it all fell from there. And if we're not careful, we can fall right back into the same pattern where we worship someone other than our Christ. We give our hearts, we make something else our heart's greatest treasure. And then I didn't have it as bitter fruit, but I might as well have had a fourth because the Lord promises, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish. Now, this is related to God's covenant promises to Israel. So there's not a direct correlation between that and us. But there is a relationship between those two things. And I would say there is a threat of perishing if you forget God and give your heart to another. You might be thinking you can just be sort of neutral. You can sort of have your affections in other places and give a little bit of affection to Jesus. And your heart, can, it, it doesn't work that way. Remember Jesus' warning in the Sermon on the Mount, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus largely was talking there about the same seduction Moses is talking about here. There's bitter fruit to forgetting God. So if you're here today and you've been, you've experienced some amnesia, Maybe the Lord wants to wake you up to that reality and to call your attention back to him, the giver of every good and perfect gift. And he would reproduce in you a proper gratitude and even amazement at his kindness to you and to yours. And maybe he could do that for us corporately as well. So there is a warning, and then the text calls us to the fruit of this forgetfulness. And then I want to talk about uh, the keys to remembering or aids to remembering. Um, th these won't all come from this text, and while I say the aids to remembering, I want to acknowledge that we could come up with more than four. We could probably, if we worked at it, I think we could probably come up with 15 or 20 or 25. It'd be like one of the old Puritan sermons. When they got to the use part of the sermon, they might have 37 uses. So we're not doing that. We have other things to do this morning. And, um, but we're going we're gonna to focus on four. And I think within the four, some of them will lead you in, in, in some other directions. Uh, the first aid to remembering is live by the Word. Live by the Word. If you go earlier in chapter 8, just listen to what he said. And he humbled you, this is verse 3, and he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of of the Lord. Live by the Word of God. Later on in chapter 32, verse 47, nearly the end of this book and near the very last words of Moses, he says, for this is not an empty word to you. It is truly your life. The Word of God is not just a handbook on how to live. It is life. 
Maybe some of you remember in John chapter 6, there's this story where Jesus is saying some really hard things about his body and his blood. And the things are so hard that people are shocked. And many of those who had been disciples are starting to leave him. They're going away. And Jesus looks at the 12 and he says, are you guys going to leave me too? And Peter said, to whom else would we go, Lord? You, with you, are the words of eternal life. There's life in the words. And you can live your life in the pages of this book. You can marinate in it. You can muse on it until it comes out your pores and out your mouth, till it affects your heart and the way you uh, put your affections on things, until it affects your mind and shapes the way you think about reality, until it affects your mouth and the things that you say and your hands and the things that you do and even your feet and the places where you go. You're to live your life by this word. Certainly you need bread. I like some. I had some of Lisa's homemade sourdough bread toasted this morning with my breakfast and it was good and I'm grateful for the bread. But loved ones, you have deeper needs than that. You're made in the image of God. You're made to know him. And you can't know him apart from living in and by this word. So fall in love with the book. And let's fall in love with the book together until it oozes out of our pores. Till if you cut us, we would bleed Bible. That's the way to live. And the Bible on every page will remind you of God. It's going to be hard for you to be forgetful about him when you're in this book all the time because it all points to him, every bit of it, all of it. So you live by the word. Second aid to remembering, an aid to memory. Rehearse the history. Rehearse the history. And I need to be careful. I could preach the whole sermon on this point. But I think this really, really matters. And much of what Moses is doing in this book with his last words is rehearsing the history. In the first five, five chapters, he just reminds them, hey, we were in Egypt. We were slaves. And the Lord with a mighty hand brought us out of there. And then he sustained us with water from the rock and, and, the, and the manna from heaven. Every day for 40 years in the wilderness, he took care of us. He carried us on, on eagle's wings. And now he's going to take us in. He didn't just bring us out, but he's bringing us in to this land flowing with milk and honey. And in other places, he calls them to remember earlier than that of Abraham and who he was and Isaac and Jacob. They were, they were to remember these things. And, and the, the Jews had all of these ways of doing it. Uh, after Moses is gone and Joshua leads them in, they, uh, God parts the Jordan River. It's at flood stage. And and, and he has 12, one from each tribe, to go back into the riverbed and to grab a stone. And they took the stones, the 12 stones, they, and they stacked them at Gilgal. And he said, in the future, when your children and your grandchildren come by these stones, and they say, Daddy, what do the stones mean? You can tell them how part of the Jordan, and you came through. You can tell them more stories than that, how we were slaves in Egypt once under Pharaoh's tyranny. But the Lord brought us out and brought Egypt to its knees and sustained us in the wilderness and brought us into this good land where we could worship him and know him and serve him and enjoy him. They had ways of remembering. You, you need to do that. Now, the, the, the memory of the Israelites, loved ones, is also our memory. We share in it. I was just reading in my quiet time this morning at Romans 9 through 11. We were this olive shoot. Those of us are not uh, Jewish ethnicity. We've got a few, but not all that many. Most of us are Europeans or from all over places in the world as far as our ethnic heritage. But we're all this olive, wild olive shoot, shoot that's been grafted into the tree of Israel. 
And so we share this heritage. So as you read your Bible and you recall, you rehearse the history, you need to know by faith it's your history. But there's more rehearsing to do than that. We should do it corporately some. And on a day like this, when we're thinking about a new chapter in the life of our church, and we're, we're contemplating embracing a big project to renew this space and space near it and the great hallway, we're talking about all that in just a few minutes. It's good for us to remember Rich Pond's history, 1972, and the store over there. It's vine covered now near the railroad tracks, but that's where it all started. Or maybe it started before that in the heart of Mary Matlock, who started praying that God would put a church, a Bible-believing gospel church in this community in Rich Pond way back in the 60s. And then God put it on the heart of a training union director at Hillview Heights to challenge some men in that group to plant a church. And Billy Hammonds and Merle Stewart caught that vision. And from a Little League baseball team morphed into a boys' Bible study, into a girls' Bible study, into a Sunday school, into a church. That's our history and our heritage. And as we think about moving forward, into beautiful things in the future, we must not disconnect from what God has done in the past. It's crucial that we recall and we remember with gratitude those things. You also need to rehearse your own personal history. It's common among Christians to think that we're supposed to forget our past, our pre-conversion life. I want to tell you that's wrong. That's unbiblical. You're supposed to remember that. Now, the Lord forgets your sins. He, or he, I shouldn't say he forgets. He doesn't forget anything. The Lord remembers your sins no more, he promises. But you're not supposed to forget them. You just think about it. We just get so fixated on Philippians where Paul says, forgetting what lies behind. But if you look at the text, he's forgetting his past achievements. When it comes to his sin... Paul rehearses them all the time. He tells his conversion story. It's told by Luke in Acts, and then he tells it twice more about, I was this, but now I'm that. In 1 Corinthians, it is by the grace of God, I am what I am. In Ephesians 2, do you remember what he says to the Ephesians? And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ by grace, you have been saved. Loved ones, we've got to rehearse our own history. I was that. But now by the grace of God, I'm this. To borrow from John Newton, I'm, I'm not what I'm going to be, and I'm not even what I ought to be. But praise God, I'm not what I used to be. Because of the triumphs of His grace, I am what I am. But you got to remember the history. If you forget all that, you'll start to think you earned your salvation. You brought all this to you. It wasn't, it wasn't grace or mercy. It was wages paid. It was due you because you served. You'll start falling into older brother mentalities. I've been slaving away for you all these years, and look how little you've done for me. No, no. No, you got to remember. You've got to never forget what you were and what you were saved from. Certainly what you've been saved to as well, but we're to rehearse that. If you have a heritage, if you're not a first-generation believer, if you are a first-generation believer, praise God. You're a brand plucked from the fire, and that's glorious and beautiful. And there's a story to be told about that. But if you have a heritage, parents who were believing and loved Jesus and grandparents and great-grandparents, then you need to rehearse the history and tell the story. 
It's important that you do that. Lisa and I hope to take our two oldest granddaughters on a heritage tour uh, this fall. And uh, they both turned 13. We did it for our first grandson when he was 13. He may have been bored out of his gourd, but we just took him. This is where we grew up. This is where Pops and Nana met. This is where your great-grandmother and great-grandfather met at Murray State University. This is where we used to hang out and, uh, you know, make eyes at each other and all that. This is, this is where I first saw your grandmother. This is where the Lord saved me. Take him to a cemetery. This is where your great-great-grandparents lie. But they won't always lie here because they knew Jesus. Eddie Creek Cemetery over in Caldwell County or Lyon County. You, if you've got a heritage, you need to rehearse it. it. Even as people who live in this nation, it wouldn't hurt us to rehearse our history. I know all of us are not citizens of this country. Most of the members of this church are. We should remember we're not all citizens. God's bringing the whole globe to this community, and it's beautiful. But whether you're a citizen or you reside here, we should know something of the history and be grateful for God's blessing on it and bloodshed to preserve it. All these things ought to be rehearsed. I know you're aware, perhaps painfully aware, that your pastor was a history major. But you just have to put up with it sometimes. But it's good. It's right. And you need aids to memory. Do you know, I, I preach with a silver dollar in my pocket. I've done that for years. When I was about 25 years old, I preached at my grandparents' church. I preached on the text about the yeast of the Sadducees and, and the Pharisees. And a, another warning passage about the hypocrisy and the way your heart could grow cold under that kind of living. And I had an uncle there, and he, I think, had lived under the tyranny of some Christian hypocrisy. And he came up to me after that sermon, and he handed me a silver dollar, and he said, Steve, I want you to put this in your pocket and always keep it there, and always remember what you preached today. I lost the silver dollar. I told this story maybe 20 years ago here, and people started handing me silver dollars. And, <laughs> And a few handed me 50 cent pieces, but um, I've got plenty of silver dollars now. But if, if I'm at myself, occasionally I forget. But most of the time when I'm preaching on a Sunday or Wednesday or anywhere, I have a silver dollar in my pocket because it's an aid to my memory that I'm not supposed to stand up and bring God's word with hypocrisy, without love in my heart for the people and for the God who called me to this task, without a desire to honor his word without humility rather than the spiritual pride of the Pharisees. And the silver dollar is an aid to my remembering, my remembering. And so we've simply got to do that. And rather ironic, but I'm forgetting my third point. So put it up on the screen uh, under this heading and you can help me. Thirdly, be a giver, be a giver. I didn't say give, I said be a giver, and, 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 that's, and there's a difference. I'm thankful for your giving, but being a giver doesn't speak to just your action and doing your duty, paying your tithe, that sort of thing. Being, being a giver speaks to the attitude of your heart. This is who I am. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I worship a giving God, and so he is making me into a, a, a giver. It's... It's who I am. And, and later on in, in, this, in this very book, he, he helps them with this giving thing. If you go to chapter, I think it's chapter 14, he talks about tithing. And he, and he says in, in that text, he says that they were to tithe. Listen to this. You have to turn to it. Verse 23 of 14. That you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. So the purpose for tithing wasn't just what would be done with the tithe. What would be done with the giving uh, as it goes and maybe supports missions and ministry and all of that or updates the church, whatever. The, the purpose was not only to change the world by the gift, 
but it was also to change the heart of the giver. It was in tithing that you learned to fear the Lord. And loved ones, you cannot simultaneously fear the Lord and forget the Lord. So you become a, a, a giver. And, and then later on when it talks about just caring for the poor, and in the Old Testament it was often the widow and the orphan and the stranger in your gate or the sojourner. Listen to what he says in verse 7 of chapter 15. If among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you, you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be, take care lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart. And you say, the seventh year, the year of release is near, and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother, and you give him nothing. Do you hear? It's not just about doing your duty. It's about being a particular kind of man or woman or boy or girl that Christ is making you into. Giving is just the natural outflow of the life that's in me. Jesus is placed there. Be a giver as the Lord gives you grace. And then fourthly, know your true treasure. Know your true treasure. You see, the danger of forgetfulness is that somehow Jesus is no longer my treasure, but this stuff that Jesus has given me becomes my treasure. My heart's no longer set on him, but it's set on this. But know what your true treasure is. So years ago, it was probably the summer of 1990, uh, Lisa and I were uh, fairly new back in Kentucky. I was pastoring an open country church. They were doing the best they could by us, but it wasn't a very big church, and we had a growing family, and uh, we, were, we were struggling to, to make it. When they called me, I thought I could live on what they were paying. They were paying 50% of their budget in pastoral salary. And I didn't think it should be any higher than that. And I said, I think I can live on that. But a couple of years in, I was beginning to wonder if we actually could. And we went over and spent some time with Lisa's parents on this, uh, they had their trailer on Lake Barkley. That was a cheap time away. They would feed us and they, there was a pool there and a lake and all that. And so we were there and uh, Josh and Joe would have been like seven and five and Jeremiah two, something like that. And I had my guitar and I was playing and we were singing, and Lisa's mom and dad were there. And her Uncle Jack and Aunt Mary were there. And we were just singing, and the boys were playing, running around doing what boys do. And Lisa's Uncle Jack leaned over and whispered in my ear. He said, Steve, you must be the richest man in the world. And I needed to hear that. Because there's truer treasure than the stuff. There just is. I get to live with the love of my life, and I got sons and daughters and grandchildren, and these are amazing gifts, but even as good as those gifts are, they aren't the truest treasure. They aren't the best treasure. Even my heart can set its affections on them in an idolatrous way rather than on my Christ. I need to be like that farmer who was plowing in the field, and he hit something, and he didn't know what it was, and so he pulls back the earth, and he sees this absolutely amazing treasure. It is so beautiful and so glorious and so wonderful that he simply has to have it. And so he hides it in the field, looks around to see if anybody else noticed, hides it in the field. He goes and sells everything that he has so that he can have the treasure. Loved ones, the treasure is Jesus. Do you have him? Does he have you? And to the wind with the rest of it. And any of the rest of it that comes your way, don't ever let your heart be full of anything but gratitude to him for providing it. But that's not your treasure. Jesus is your treasure. Has your heart found that treasure? If he is your treasure, then you cannot forget him. Now, the sad rest of the story is the Israelites didn't heed the warning very well, and they forgot. In Judges 8, 34, it says they forgot. In Jeremiah 2, 32, Jeremiah in his first sermon said, Can a virgin 
forget her adornment? Can a bride forget her clothing? Yet my people have forgotten me more days than I can number. Now, I had a wedding yesterday, and Ashton Vandiver might have forgotten this or that, but I promise you, she wouldn't have forgotten the dress. That is not happening. And yet, the Lord says, my people have forgotten me. It should never be. It shouldn't have been, but it was. And we need to hear the warning that it could be true of us as well. Now, the Bible kind of answers the why question of that. It really does. It, it tells us that, that why, they, why they forgot. If, if, if you look at chapter 29, it, it'll, it'll tell us that. It'll tell us what happened. It, it says the Lord had not given them hearts to believe and ears to hear. It's 29 verse 4. But to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. And they didn't have hearts. Later on in chapter 30, he gives promises and their new covenant promises. Their promises for us. Chapter 30 verse 6, and the Lord will, your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. You see, we're in the new covenant. And while the Israelites forgot the Lord, we must never forget him. So many of them, most of them, never got new hearts. But we're in Christ, loved ones. We've been regenerated. We've been newborn. And these new hearts must delight in her truest treasure, and that's Jesus. Do you know him? Are you living for him? Is, is all of the blessings of your life seen through the lens of Christ? Or maybe you don't know him, and what you need to do is start right there. Get a new heart through the gospel. Lay all your sin on Jesus and his dying love, his crucifixion. Lay all your sin there and receive the cleansing that only comes from his blood and the life that only comes from his resurrection. And as you receive him in repentance and faith, then resolve to never forget him even one day. Let's pray. Help us, Lord, to honor you with our lives. We need you. Apart from your touch, apart from your spirit's work, we get amnesia really easily. Please don't let it be so. And where it has been true of us, Lord, give us grace right now to turn back to you, to recall and remember and rehearse and be absolutely wonderstruck with gratitude at your love to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.